Yo, 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 yo. Hey, guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show. You ever thought, gosh, costs are rising in dentistry. I need to find a way to save this practice some money. Because every time I save a dollar on the overhead, it goes right to profit. Well, today, we're going to share one game-changing way to save your practice some money with one of our amazing coaches. Her name is Miranda Beeson, and she shares a methodology that if you use, it will change the game for you. So please listen up. I know you guys will enjoy it, and we'll see you soon. Welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. I am freaking loving this. You know why? There's a lot of reasons why. Number one is I love this profession. Number two, I'm surrounded by really amazing, smart people. And you're going to hear one of them today or see one of them today if you're watching the podcast. Her name is Miranda Beeson. Number three, I want to do all we can for this great profession to give you great tools, great frameworks so that you can create a better practice and a better life. And one of the things that a lot of dentists are asking us about is how do I save money? Costs are rising. How do I control or contain costs in this world to improve profitability? And today we're going to be talking about one game-changing way to save your practice money with Miranda Beeson, one of our amazing coaches here. Miranda, thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me back. I'm excited to help people learn how to save money. Yeah, you're going to do more than that. You're going to change some lives today. So Miranda is one of our amazing coaches here. She um, she not only gets a chance to work with some top practices all over, but she has held many positions in a dental practice. So this is not an amateur you're listening to. She's what we affectionately refer to. I'm going to keep using your title, the solutionist. So uh, Miranda, just give us a little background. What do you do every day? I don't know. What, what do you do if you're a practice coach? Oh, gosh. I get the pleasure of working with teams all across the country. I get calls with doctors, helping them to make their practice more profitable, helping to make their teams healthier. I get to talk with their teams as well. So some of the strategies we'll talk about today, usually I'm working through with the team members who are responsible for managing some of the costs within the practice and really just helping to motivate and guide and inspire them to have the better practice and better life through the tools that we have here at ACT and just managing issues so they don't feel so alone in the process. It's really fun. Yeah. And the cool thing about the concept that we're going to share with you today is this doesn't fall solely on the shoulders of the dentist. This is where you can bring in your team. Now, talk about why this concept is so important, Miranda. Sure. So costs are on the rise, like you said. We know that in the world, much less in dentistry, but anyone who's listening who works in the dental world, a practice owner, you have felt that pain over the last couple of years. It's, you know, we're pinching our pennies harder and harder as time goes on. And if we aren't moving forward and keeping up with those trends, then we're ultimately moving backwards. So we want to make sure that we're doing things within the practice to keep up with those changes and the costs going up within just society in general, with our economy. Um, if you don't tell your money how to work for you, then it's going to take over. It's going to control you. And at the end of the month, you're sitting there going, oh, man, I feel like I worked so hard and I thought we would have more in the bank than this. And so if we can get control of that and tell our money how to work for us in the practice, then we're going to be happier in the end and we're going to feel a little less stressed and maybe even take some more vacations throughout the year. Reward our teams a little bit more. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now that's a big thing that you just shared. And I want you to go back to that uh, because one of the things that we've always taught is money has no intelligence. Money doesn't, th it doesn't think on its own. It's like water. You show it where to go. And when you show it where to go, which is creating a system, it goes there predictably, right, Rihanna? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. It's kind of like when I go to Target, right? If I only have $200 in my wallet, I'm only going to spend $200. If I don't, I might throw an extra bathing suit in there or, oh, let's try this new $30 
shampoo. I've never seen this one before. And all of a sudden you spent $340 at Target and you didn't mean to. So if you have a plan for your money and you're telling it how to work for you, uh, you're going to end up better in the end. You're going to have a little extra in your pocket at the end of the day or at the end of the month. Yeah. You have to make sure that you're in charge. Don't let your money control you. Right, right. That is so true. A couple other things to remember as you're listening to this, your business will eat all that you leave in the account. It'll just swallow it up. So you want to make sure that you've got channels, disciplines, all of that. We'll get into that in a little bit. Now, everything we have, we have what's called the gaps calculator, which I'll get to in a little bit, but every dollar you save goes right down to the bottom line called profit. So these small changes make big impacts over time. So Miranda, where do I start? What's step number one? Step number one, and what we're going to be talking about mostly today is around the overhead gap, our supply budget specifically. So when we're looking at our, we have the gaps calculator at ACT, as you know, Kirk, and a lot of the people listening are familiar with us talking about as well. And one of the gaps is our overhead gap. And how can we shrink that gap to help save the practice money and become more profitable? And one of the pieces of that overhead gap and it's a piece that we can share with our team because they contribute to this is our supply budget. And our supply budget should be around that 5% mark of our overall budget. And so if you're consistently at seven or 8%, it doesn't seem like it's that much more, but when you look at seven or 8% of a million dollar or multi-million dollar practice, like that's a lot of money throughout the year. So that's where those small changes really come into making big impacts. So when we're looking at our supply budget, the first thing that I have teams do is inventory what you already have. So go through every single operatory and do some spring cleaning. Usually there's things tucked away. There's an assistant who's like, man, my doctor uses this so often. I'm going to keep a couple extra in here so that I don't have to hunt it down or fight Susie for it. So first things first, inventory your operatories. Do a good clean sweep and get everything standardized. Not only is that going to help you to find materials that you may have in the practice that you don't realize you have, maybe you think you're out of, it's also going to help you standardize and make your flow more efficient when your rooms are now clean and set up and functioning just like one another throughout the practice. But the big factor is you're going to find a lot of gems when you go through and clean out your operatories. Yeah, absolutely. And get rid of those cabinets if you can, because it's only junk inside. Those. I was getting ready to say, I worked with a doctor who, when he was doing a remodel, he said, we're going to have one cabinet in each operatory because the more cabinets and drawers we have, the more supplies and things are getting stuffed away. And that's just money that you're throwing in the trash can ultimately. Because by the time you find it, I have a practice I just did this with not too long ago. And they're like, we found so many expired products. Mm -hmm. And every, like, it just hurt his heart throwing each and every one of them into the trash can because it's expired. You know, you can't use it now. Right. So there's a lot of money sitting right there in your operatories. Just, you know, you have a cancellation in your schedule. We want to be as productive as possible with that downtime. Hey, let's go through this operatory today while we have this hour opening. Let's see what we can find and strategically inventory those ops and really just have enough in the operatory to function throughout your work week. Don't right. carry back stock in the ops. That's where you can get into trouble. That's where you forget. Like, think about your junk drawer at home. I don't know in, in, if that's regional, but most people have a junk drawer. In our house, I have one and my husband has one. We have so much junk we can't share. But when you clean that out a couple times a year, you're like, oh man, I forgot I even had this gift certificate. We should go out to dinner. Right. Absolutely. You don't even want to look in my junk drawers, but I found that once I clean them out, I feel better. You're right. Yes. You unearth all these things. I also experienced tremendous guilt saying, you know how much I paid for this two years ago? And there it is. I haven't even opened up. The plastic is still on the box. Yeah. And in an office, the other thing that happens a lot is a lot of offices will just have a list, right? That's, that's kind of their ordering system. They have a list, a clipboard or a dry erase board or something in a general space. And when someone realizes, oh, we're out of this, they write it on the list. And then that's how they decide what gets ordered. But are we really out of that? We might have seven of the of that object, that item, spread throughout our operatories, and we just don't know 
because we're keeping this back stock or we're hoarding things or even unintentionally because I've been a clinician, I will unintentionally start to stockpile things and then you just get busy and you're like, I'm going to put that back, but then you don't. And then next thing you know, you forgot it was even in there. So we want to make sure that we're making use of what we have and making sure that we already have um, inventory, not only in our operatories, but also look in your lab, look in those general spaces, um, open the cabinets. How, how often are we really cleaning out our laboratories, our storage closets, the pantries in our offices to see what we have already at our disposal? Yeah, absolutely. I want to go back to a couple of things. You should have some type of a list of inventory, but remember it's dynamic. It's always changing based on how many providers, what you need, and somebody should own the optimal number of things. So start with a written list and make sure it's consistently updated. Now, Miranda, when you talk about the lab supply closet, general spaces, and uh, even shelves, I've seen this so many times. I don't know who pioneered this, but it's great. You can use this in your practice. I've seen it probably 12 to 15 times where dentists will segment spaces on their shelves with tape. So they'll use this white athletic tape and they'll tape off a space that's exactly one foot wide. And they know exactly that 12 bottles fit in that 12, you know, that one foot space. And so the team members intuitively can see, oh, there's three missing from there. I'll order three. They don't over order. They keep exact. And now you can move the tape. You can move the tape to a foot and a half or two feet and what everyone knows intuitively, oh, a few boxes missing from that. Now you can go to the next step, James Woodyard in Indiana. He put barcodes on it. He's like, I constantly have, I have a barcode system. So when it comes out, it gets barcoded. When it goes in, it goes barcoded. We know what we have on, you know, on the premise. Now that's 2.0, but make it simple. Don't you think? Absolutely. I really like the idea of that. I've seen that before. I have also seen where um, offices will have maybe a little sticker that has a number in front of the item. So when we, we know that's our threshold item. When we get to two of these on the shelf, now it's time to order. Um, the other thing, like you said, is making sure that there's a person or maybe a couple of people, but it's it's designated that are responsible for monitoring the ordering. When we what we say at ACT is when everyone's responsible, no one's responsible, right? When everyone's doing it, nobody's doing it. So if you have a, one or two people that are designated to be responsible for your ordering, they will double check and and see did two people write this on the list because two people saw that we were down to two or two people in the office saw that that tape was at the point where we we met our threshold so you do still have to have a really simplified system try to have something that's really easy and efficient in the office and then having designated people to manage that system what I really love as well that I've had the opportunity of using when I was in practice was a barcode scanner ordering system where you can have the item barcode on right there in front of like on the shelf in front of whatever it is and you just have a little scanner. And when you see you've hit that threshold of two or whatever you decide that it is, all you have to do is grab it, scan it. And now whoever's doing your ordering, when they go in to order from their supplier, it's already uploaded right off of that scanner and everything's there. And it'll highlight duplicates for you and help do some of that work. So we want to work smarter, not harder, for sure. We don't want to make this a, a bigger job for someone than it needs to be. We want to make it an easier job for somebody um, and a more efficient process in the practice. Yeah. I love what you just said about the barcode system because one of the things that gets forgotten is finding the product again. So <laughs> you go back, you're like, where did we order this from? I can't remember. The barcode takes you right to it. Saves yep. hundreds of hours of time over the long haul. So absolutely. Good stuff. Now, what about the money? You know, step number two is we're going to set up a su supply budget. Now, you help dentists do this. Walk me through that. Yes, absolutely. I often will just, first thing I do is ask, who's doing your ordering? And then I'll ask the person who's doing the ordering, so what's your budget? And that helps me to, to learn, do they have a budget? I love it when someone's like, oh, we base it off of our previous month coll collections. And I'm like, yeah, you guys are crushing it. Every, I would say most of the time, you know what? I would love a budget because I don't ever really know if I'm spending too much or too little. So that's really step two is set a supply budget. And so really you want to look at your previous month's collections. What we just talked about in overhead is if you're looking at the month that just happened, then you want for last month's supply budget to be within 5% of your overall spend. However, you don't know what your collections are going to be for this month. So how do I predict 
5% of this month. Well, we're going to base it off of last month because that's the most predictable, closest way we're going to get to knowing. So we'll look at last month's collections and that's going to guide our budget. So we're going to take whatever we collected last month, 5% of that will be our max budget for this month when we're placing orders. And so now whoever's responsible for your ordering, or if it's you as the practice owner, you know, I have this much money, $12,000, whatever it may be to work with this month. And when I hit that limit, I'm done spending. That's the key, right? right? We It's not just setting the budget, but stop when you when you hit that budget. You want to make sure that you align with your team around this and that they know. If you're not the person doing the ordering, you have to share with the person who's doing the ordering what that budget is and why right. so that they know and can be responsible to stay within the expectations of that budget. Yeah. I love that. So if you're listening, we're going to go back and review the important. Number one, somebody's got to own it. That's really important because if everybody owns it, nobody owns it. One person owns the budgeting. You might have a second person that orders and they own that. Who owns this? That's number one. And number two, if I work for you and I'm a team member, I can't hit the target unless I know what the target is. And we talk about hitting the target and there's some recognition for hitting the target. It doesn't have to be monetary. It can be like, hey, listen, Great job on hitting the target. And let's talk about how we can consistently better hit the target in the future. So love it. And I'll say this to no one's fault, right? If you don't have a budget set up within your practice, it, it may just be that, you know, maybe you don't know what the what the budget should be. What is the, um, what is our profession's industry standard for what the budget should be around that? Like that's, that's what I help practices do, right? If I talk to a team member and they don't know, you know, I've asked the doctor for a budget. I've never gotten a budget from them. So I just order what we need. Well, maybe the doctor doesn't know what the budget should be. And we work with doctors who don't, don't know how to calculate their overhead. Like there's no shame in that game. Like if I go to the doctor and say, Hey, I talked to Susie and she really wants to have a budget for ordering. I want to help her get going with that. Let's take a look at your overhead. And they look at me like a deer in the headlights. Now I know, okay, no problem. Let's just talk about how do we make that happen? Right. That's what Barrett talks about all the time. You can do it in 60 seconds if you want to know just overall, and then we can get specific and we can get down to supply specific parts of that overhead budget. But it's easy enough to figure out. It's just a matter of admitting if you don't know and you're not there yet and finding a way or finding a mentor or a coach or someone who can help you figure out what those numbers should be and just get aligned with your team. Once you're aligned and you're all working towards that target, they they want, those team members want to, to stay within that budget. Like they get pretty excited when you look back. If I look back with my teams and say, hey, let's look at your supply budget from last month. And they're like, oh, I crushed it. I was at 4% last month. And it's like, that's amazing. You guys used to be at 8%. And they're still doing the same amount of dentistry, if not more. They're still producing the same quality of care. They're just being more intentional about how they're spending that money and how often and where. Yeah. Use the magic word. One of my favorite words, which is align. You and I did a podcast a little back about when tires aren't aligned. And so don't undervalue the importance of being aligned with anyone who has a responsibility. Schedule some aligned time. You know, time alignment. I said that. Time alignment, alignment time. Alignment time. That's what <laughs> I was trying to say. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. But, uh, time where you can say, okay, let's make sure we're aligned because that's when things go weird. You thought one thing, they thought another. You can't just say it once and set it and forget it. Constantly aligned. And then over time, step number three, we got to track what we spend, right? Yes. If you set the budget, that's great. But how do we know if we're staying within that budget? And there's a lot of ways that you can do this as well. And it's really pretty simple. So one of the tools that we use is a supply, a supply budget tracker. Look at me now, blah, blah, blah. A supply, <laughs> it's contagious, supply budget tracker where we look at collections from last month. Okay, what's 5% of that? That's going to go right at the top of our supply budget. And now we know we're working down from there. Everything that we order throughout the month, we need to track and determine how much we have left to spend next. And then you want to you want to make sure that you're monitoring your invoices as well. When you're getting invoices, I say this for labs as well, which could be a whole nother podcast overhead around labs. Um, but you want to monitor your invoices. You want to double check just like you would if you go out to a restaurant and you just do a, an eye test, you do a glance over. Did I buy 
extra beer? No? Okay, good. I'm going to go ahead and take care of this. Just look at your invoices, make sure you're on track, but then look at where you are compared to your budget for the month mm -hmm. and have you hit that budget? If so, what do we do? That's a big yeah. question teams have is like, oh, wait, if we've been spending 8% and now you're telling me I can only spend 5%. So what am I going to do? Not order as many things. No, we need to have a plan for a contingency plan for when we hit max. I've I've already maxed out that 12,000 for this month, but we're going to run out of gloves. Like we need to order. Okay. So every supply ordering system that you develop should have a little contingency plan at the end, a plan B. When we hit max, what do we do? Right. And maybe it's, okay, I go to my office manager or I go to the practice owner and we talk about, we've hit budget, but we are going to run out of gloves before the next month. Great. Now they may stamp approval for you, but they're going to be intentional about that decision. How, you know, you're going to think it through instead of just swiping the card and getting right. more. I love it. I love it. And one of the things you mentioned was the invoice. The invoice is one of the greatest gifts to all of business. Now, an invoice isn't from a company where you open it up and it says you have to pay this much. Now, I'm just giving you a little lesson here because a lot of dentists think, oh, I get invoices from all these companies. No, those are called bills. Invoices are when you purchase something, you make a decision. So when you're ordering supplies, somebody on your team should create an invoice that creates a number saying on XYZ day, we, the invoice 1001 ordered these three products. And when they come in, you reconcile against the invoice to make sure that the out matches the in. You do it in Dentrix. It's called production. Production is your invoice. Collections is what came in against the, the invoice. So you want to make sure that there's a good out versus in. It's amazing how many people, and actually I didn't know what an invoice was until I got three years into QuickBooks. And they're like, you're not invoicing. I'm like, I don't need to. And they're like, yes, <laughs> you have to. It creates really clean accounting. So make sure that you use the invoice function in your practice. Well, it can help you with inventory too. That like idea, like you were talking about before, if you have it set up within a system uh, that that is set up with barcode scanners and things of the nature, it can be very efficient, but it does also help you from an inventory standpoint. And, the, you know, another thing to think about is um, working with your rep, your reps, like you're probably spending more than you need to spend on some items. And so if you're tracking your spending and you go like, okay, you know, we're, we're really low. I need to get some bibs. Maybe we'll take a look at a generic brand, an alternate brand of bibs, because how specific do we really need to be? Now you may be a doctor who only works with 3M products. Fine. You may be a doctor or a hygiene team that only likes two by twos that are compact, not woven. Fine. <laughs> However, there are things within the practice that you could probably get a generic version of or another brand of, or maybe something's on sale this month. So there's also that mindset around um, exploring new things and having an open mind to try in something new. So when you're tracking what you're spending, part of what you should be tracking is looking at how much uh, these things cost. Look at each item at some point, maybe not every time, every month, but looking at what am I really spending? Oh my goodness, Profi Paste is how much? I bet I can find a comparable that saves me, you know, half the amount of money. And, and I bet you can too, because I've seen it happen. <laughs> I've seen teams do it. So that's a big piece of it is start at the top. What's my budget? Um, like we said, set the budget, align with your team around the budget. So everyone knows that target that we're aiming for. And then throughout the month, as you're ma making purchases, track what you're spending. Now, some software programs, like I know Henry Schein does this, um, Patterson probably does as well. All of the big supply chains pretty much do this. You can set parameters within their software. So if you're a practice owner and you have an assistant who's responsible for ordering, you can set a max that alerts you. Once we've spent this much each month, send me an email so I know we're close to budget. So now as the practice owner, I don't have to worry about ordering. I have delegated that to someone else that I trust. However, if we're getting close to budget or if we hit budget, I can get alerts in my email. And now I know I need to work a lot tighter with my ordering coordinator until the end of the month to make sure we're staying on track for that target. Yeah. I love this. This framework, follow the framework that Miranda's laid out here. 
Because some dentists, you know who you are, you start at the bottom of what Miranda talked about, where you're just looking for cheaper supplies. Cutting is no way to improve it. You have to first inventory what you have, set up a budget, then track what you spend. You're going to save so much on that. And you can also retain the quality. Going cheap just to reduce the outflow is not a good strategy. You're going to frustrate yourself and your team members and everybody else. You can do that after you've covered those initial points. Would you agree? Well, that's another good reason to make sure you're bringing your team in on this on this strategy. If your team all of a sudden just sees all of these new products coming from different places, some of which they don't like, and they're not allowed to give feedback on, it's like, well, this is what we're ordering because we need to save some money. You're going to make people pretty unhappy. And I think we all know that right now finding new team members is pretty challenging. So we want to make sure we're doing things to make sure our team feels like their voice is heard in this as well. So if we bring this to a team meeting and we say, hey, here's where we're at. We're at 8%, we want to be around 5% because that's what's going to be healthiest for the practice and for you guys, for me to keep paying and rewarding you. And so together, let's strategize on how we can possibly try some new products. I want your feedback though. If I get some, you know, new two by twos, and I use that as an example because that happened to me in a practice, we were all like, these are the worst. (laughs) Um, So if we get two by twos, you don't like them. Okay, let me know. We're going to still work through what we bought. But maybe next time we'll either go back or try something different. But you have to stay in communication just like anything else. Otherwise, people are going to storytell and they're going to create their own mindset around why is he getting so cheap all of a sudden? Why all of a sudden is she making us try all these products from who knows where? They're going to start having their own thoughts around it versus you being in control of that narrative with them and bringing them into the fold and letting them be a part of the decision making and making this happen. It doesn't all have to be on your shoulders as the practice owner. Yeah, that is so well said, Miranda. Remember, when I don't know the story, I tell myself a story. So if I see all these cheap supplies coming in, I'm thinking Doc doesn't have any money. Like, we're not doing so well. Make sure the story they are telling themselves is accurate. So be part and because of I'm a hygienist, I can say this. Uh, hygienists are probably the toughest crowd with trying new products. They have the toothbrush that they like to recommend to their patients. They have the Profi paste that they like. I only like this polishing cup. I only like this air polishing powder. We, we get pretty ingrained in the things that we like having in our operatory, and we get really comfortable with those things. And I think hygienists, and I've been there, are some of the worst to try new products. It's just what? hard. But if you don't try something new, you might find your new favorite thing. What are you really trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. It's true. It's you know. true. Yeah. I worked in an office where there was um, four hygienists, all of which had a different style and type of to- toothbrush that they ordered to give to patients because they couldn't agree that they all liked the same one. And it, And again, I was part of that team, right? I had ones that I liked the best. But if you don't try new things and experiment, then you might find something that you really, really do like. You like it even better. And guess what? You saved the practice some money on that new product as well. A lot of times, things that are disposables are the easiest to start with. Again, saliva ejectors, bibs, two-by-twos, cotton rolls. You can you can get a little flexible with those and not pay top dollar and still get the same outcome. Absolutely. 100%. So any final takeaways you have, Miranda, on how we can save the practice some money? Yeah. So um, like I mentioned before, like work with your rep, let them know, you know, you can request, hey, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to have a list of the top products that we ordered last year, maybe the top 25, top 30 products that we ordered last year. And I'd really like to do some cost comparison and have them help you with that. They they can do that for you and they will do that for you. Um, a lot of times their name brand, like their company brand items, which are considered, so again, I shop at like Harris Teeter. Your, your Simple Truth brand or the Harris Teeter brand versus um, a name brand might be a little bit less expensive, but of the same quality. There's some things, my mom would argue, don't ever buy powdered sugar that's not that's not Domino's. Okay. It doesn't bake the same. So there's some things that you want to make sure you're keeping to the brand that you trust, but there are some things that they can work out for you. So have them draw up a list of your top items that you've ordered from the previous year and do some cost comparisons and have them help you work through that. The other thing is 
evaluate and reevaluate your ordering system. Hold yourself accountable, hold your team accountable to the budget and revisit that over and over again. You're going to want to revisit it month by month by month and then check in with your team quarterly. You know, you're ordering, you're going to want to keep an eye on it monthly. You always want to know where you're at. Have meetings monthly or quarterly with your ordering coordinator to make sure you're in alignment. And then just keep the whole team communicated with throughout the process and getting their feedback. But just don't set it and forget it. Okay, we set up an ordering system. Now Susie's going to run with it. But Susie might fall off a little bit with that too because she got really busy last month. And if you're not checking it, She's never going to be held accountable. So then it starts to be less important for her. And Susie's got a lot of priorities in the office. And for this to maintain as a top priority, she has to know that it's something that's a top priority for you, the practice owner. So we have to have repeated accountability and evaluating that system to make sure it's working for us. Love it. So well said, Miranda. Thank you so much for sharing this. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to share it. It's one of the easiest things that I think practices can do to make an impact with with minimal effort and not really having to affect other things within the practice. A lot of the things that we do and coach with teams, they do have ripple effects into other areas of the office. This is something that's pretty uh, streamlined and you can jump into it quickly. You can make an impact within a month's time. And it really doesn't have a ripple effect on much of anything else in the practice. So it's an easy go-to to to start saving money month by month. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So uh, make sure you share this podcast with your team members that would be responsible for this. This will give you a common dialogue. Our goal is to bring you a lot of tools, frameworks, podcasts, you know, anything that'll help you better communicate these concepts with your team members. Now, I mentioned the GAPS calculator earlier. It's one of the greatest things we've ever enjoyed about analyzing dental practices where you can identify uh, opportunities in your overhead gap. You can have a copy of the calculator. If you email Gina on our team, she's kind of like the tool expert. You know, she'll help you. Not She'll get you the gaps calculator. And then she'll also check back with you to make sure you did it right and identify some opportunities. So her email address, it's down in the show notes, G I N A at actdental.com. We're happy to share it with you because it's going to make your practice better. Also, in the fall, we're doing our strategic planning to the top study club, which is where we take the entire dental practice. You take the past performance, current performance, and you apply it to the future performance down to numbers, days, production, overhead, write-offs. And so mathematically and very specifically, you can create a plan for the next year. And you're not doing it in January. You're doing it in October so that you're ready with the plan when January comes around. We'll put a link in the show notes. If you guys want to join us, I promise you, you will absolutely love it. And you'll have a lot of confidence going into next year. So Miranda, stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else. But thank you guys for listening to the Best Practices Show. Hey, if you enjoyed today, please do us a favor, hit the share button, share this with your friends. We're loving this. The podcast keeps growing. We got younger, uh, more people listening to it all over the place. I don't know how it's working. I don't even care. We're just going to keep bringing it. New information, um, a lot of new thinking from great thinkers, great teachers, great coaches in this industry. And I just want to say thank you. So thanks for listening. And until we see you guys next time or you hear from us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the Best Practices Show. You guys enjoy your day. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your day. I can't even talk today. (laughs) Enjoy your day. (laughs) 